Hello, and I would like to welcome the over a thousand online attendees to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm Will Trace, Lockheed Martin Fellow Emeritus, former chair of ACM SIGSOF and member of the ACM Professional Development Committee. For more on my background, see the bio widget on your screen. For those of you who are familiar with ACM or what it has to offer, here is more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in a constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM learners sending resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides access to an ACM digital library, the world's most comprehensive database on computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, and the ACM Turing, <coughs> Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards. And the ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. Finally, ACM enables its members to solve critical problems in using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. If you're experiencing a problem with your slides or audio, refresh your browser or close and relaunch the presentation. If you have any questions during this talk, please type them in the Q&A box at any time. Click the Submit button. I'll do my best to organize the questions as Bertrand speaks, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available, and check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill out to help us improve our tech talks. You may also open a link to the survey at any time from the resource window. Finally, you can use the widgets at the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag, hashtag ACML Learning. We'll be watching for your tweets. We also have a community discourse page to continue the discussion after this webcast, including questions we will be able to answer during the Q&A session. Today's presentation is the four pegs of requirement engineering by Bertrand Meyer. Bertrand is a professor of software engineering provost at the Schaffhausen Institute of Technology in Switzerland and CTO of Eiffel, software based in Santa Barbara. He is the author of several well-known books on software topics, particularly object technology, programming languages, software verification, and agile methods. He is the recipient of the ACM Software System Award and the IEEE Harlan Mills Prize and an ACM Fellow. His previous ACM tech talks were devoted to design by contract, agile message methods, and concurrent programming. Bertrand, without further ado, let's take it away. Thanks a lot, Will. Uh, it's a very nice introduction. Indeed, it's the first time I'm uh, giving one of these tech talks, so I'm really honored to be invited uh, again. And my goal is that you invite me for a fifth time, so you'll tell me at the end uh, how, how, how I did. The, uh, people are busy and in a hurry these days, so I'm going to spill the beans uh, in the first uh, two slides, and then you can decide whether to stay on afterwards for the other 15 minutes or so or not. So I am uh, concentrating on requirements and what it takes to have good requirements for software systems and uh, the uh, part of the message is that it takes uh, four elements uh, uh, which uh, correspond to uh, the pegs uh, of the, of the 
title requirements are about build, developing a, a, or a, conducting a project to, to work in a, a certain uh, environment to Uh, to achieve some goals of the company or enterprise or organization. And of course, you do this by uh, building a, a system. So I'm going to emphasize the importance of treating these uh, four elements. Elements as equally relevant and equally valuable. And uh, another outcome of this uh, presentation is going to be a, a A standard plan that I'm proposing for requirements to to replace the venerable but but quite old uh, a standard plan that many people are using in the industry going back to a 1998 IEEE. standard. So it's not really a requirements document, as we're going to see it. It's more like a collection of requirements because we're in 2021 and we don't just produce linear uh, requirements uh, documents. So it consists of four parts, which I call books, the project book, the goals book, the environment book, and the system book, corresponding, of course, to the four pegs that I mentioned before and as we go further i'm going to describe at some general level uh, the contents of these uh, books and uh, see how they can be used in uh, practice. So more generally, this work is about trying to develop a comprehensive approach to requirements engineering in line with with modern views of software development to a certain extent that requirements engineering is the poor cousin of the software engineering family we have made tremendous progress in other areas like uh, programming, like programming languages, like uh, project management, 
design and so on requirement engineering are still lagging behind at least if we consider the practice of the industry and I'm trying to do my bit to help uh, catch up to the rest of software engineering. There are four parts in the store. I'm going to start with the precise definition of the concepts. Then I'm going to introduce some principles for good requirements. Then I'll then talk about the plan. And finally, because requirements are only useful for a big purpose, which is to build good systems, I'll uh, discuss a little bit how we can have an effective software lifecycle model that, that integrates requirements. Uh, this is uh, uh, so I, I started getting really in this topic a year or two ago and started writing a book on the topic, which I hope will appear probably not in the spring, but uh, in, the, in the summer uh, or fall of this. Of this, of this year, and so uh, basically, if you like this talk, you should uh, buy my book uh, when it appears, and if you don't like this talk, you should actually buy my book when it appears because I'm a much better writer than a speaker. The, uh, a, a few acknowledgments. This is uh, largely the result of uh, teamwork with a uh, group of uh, very nice uh, people people from uh, France and uh, Russia the uh, 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 University in Kazan in Russia and the University of Toulouse And we have a number of papers together that I will uh, mention. I would also like to acknowledge the many people whose work on requirements have influenced me over the years. And they there are too many to be uh, to, to be listed, and of course, I'm not implying any endorsement. Actually, I'm uh, quite sure that uh, uh, several of them uh, will disagree with much of with some, at least. Uh, 
of what I have to say, but uh, it doesn't uh, prevent me from acknowledging, acknowledging they are really welcome influence. Okay, so apart one key requirements concepts. The first thing to do in any scientific or technology discipline is to define the basic concepts properly. Now, I I said I got interested in requirements, specifically in the past couple of years or so. Uh, many people, of course, have written about requirements, and it's customary to, to start any discussion of requirements with this uh, quote from Fred Brooks, which, which I'm not going to read. One thing I'm not going to do, uh, for mostly for lack of time, is to, to try to justify the importance of requirements by giving you a step statistics on uh, projects that failed uh, because of bad requirements, I assume by, by default that you, if you are here, it, 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 I don't need to convince you that requirements are important. Uh, I should, uh, I will only, only say that in my experience that are They are really a sore point in software engineering. One of the things I do is that I serve as software expert in legal cases, uh, you know, the, the typical situation in which company A sues company B uh, over a failed project, and they have a software expert to try to ascertain blame, and very often the, the, the root of the problem can be traced, at least in part to, to bad requirements. In the field of requirements, uh, we suffer from a number of uh, chasms. Uh, chasm between theory and practice. The, there, there's a lot of um, uh, excellent work on, um, uh, on requirements. Requirements exemplified for, uh, among others, by uh, some really good books, and this is not even a complete list. Uh, on the other hand, the way uh, industry practices requirements when they produce requirements at all tends to be quite far from, from the picture that you find in the, in the books. Uh, 
basically, in my experience at least, the vast majority of companies and projects that actually perform requirements do so using either use cases or user stories, depending more or less on the on the community. User stories, of course, are the dominant practice in the agile world. Well, so in both cases, we have scenarios at a different level of granularity. Use cases are scenarios of full-fledged interactions. With the system, user stories are, are more fine grain. They are about uh, the documenting specific user needs. Now, scenarios, uh, be they use cases or user stories. But, but by the way, they so somehow we between my uh, sending of the slides and the displaying, there's been a little bit of a mix-up. I hope we don't have too much of that in in future slides. So you, uh, you, you can probably, uh, well, the, the user story is supposed to say, is, is using this uh, standard uh, form of, as a role, uh, I want to uh, a business. Uh, I want to function in order to satisfy a certain business function. Like as a system administrator, I uh, want to hide user requests so that I can enjoy my uh, holidays, which is a somewhat uh, admittedly facetious uh, user story. I, I don't want to offend too many system administrators in the audience. In both cases, use cases and user stories, these are two requirements what tests are to programs. That is to say, they, do, they document specific cases, which is very important, actually, without user use cases or user stories where there is a real risk, as Eva Jakobson in particular has, uh, has emphasized. Often there's a, a, a real risk to go too far into abstraction and forget the needs of the users. On the other hand, if use cases or user stories are necessary, they're not sufficient. And I don't know about you, but what I'm using modern systems very often, I, f I find myself in a situation which clearly was not was one of the uh, planned for uh, use cases. We need something more abstract, and I'm going to uh, to try to suggest what that is. Another chasm is more a culture clash uh, between the traditional waterfall-like uh, big project uh, setting and, and uh, mindset on the left, where you're supposed to do requirements, and then when those requirements have been uh, defined, they are frozen, and, and the rest of the process consists of uh, designing and implementing the solution. Of course, this is a fairy tale. No, no store, no project in the history of the world has ever worked uh, like this. Uh, it, it's an extreme, but it's 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 a useful uh, point if you like on the spectrum of possibilities. At the other extreme, you have the agile view, uh, which uh, is very wary of anything that is done at the beginning. You know, big upfront X, be it a big upfront design or, or requirements, and there's a general. All, uh, although you know, there's some really good books on and uh, really good work on uh, requirements for agile methods, still there is a certain um, uh, distrust of, uh, of requirements in the agile world in general, as, a, as illustrated by this citation for, by uh, Mary Popendi, creator of uh, Lean Software. Actually, she, in some ways, uh, she, she has a point uh, that. Uh, uh, requirements are really candidate solutions. Well, uh, she, may, she means it in a critical way. Uh, it, it actually can be understood much more positively. But I think this uh, quotation, this quote, is representative of the kind of um, lack of trust uh, uh, that uh, exists with respect to requirements, in particular upfront requirements in the Agile 
uh, world. Then we have a, a third chasm, which is a personal uh, uh, chasm, a personal clash between the IT culture of requirements engineers and the domain experts uh, culture of what is known as SME, subject matter experts. Uh, they're, they're both, have, both categories have to be involved in requirements, and it doesn't always work very well. Talking about the practice, today's practice, many companies, many projects still use the structure provided in the old 1998 recommended practice for software for SRS from the IEEE. It's actually a pretty um, decent uh, stru structure, which has been used by, by many projects that turned out to be very useful, but it's really simple, uh, or to the point of almost uh, simplistic. And for the kind of projects that we have today, we can do uh, better. Now, talking about standards, there were some comments in the um, in the uh, uh, ACM channel um, uh, uh, next to the announcement of this talk. Uh, so someone wrote that the presenter. Uh, at least know about more recent uh, standards from the IEEE. Well, yes, uh, and but unfortunately, I'm not 100% uh, enthused. So, for example, you have, I think this is the 2005 version of the IEEE Systems Engineering Standard. They define requirement as a statement that identifies a product or process operate. Actually, I cannot even read it because I cannot parse it. I, I, to, to me, it's not even quite passable uh, English, but you know, going beyond the surface and looking at what it's really trying to, to say, there's a really serious problem with this kind of definition, which is that it confuses the prescriptive and the descriptive. A definition should be descriptive. You know, you, speed is the ratio of uh, distance traveled over uh, time. You you do the description descriptive part before you start talking about speed limits. And it's it, it's all right to tell people not to go too fast, but first you have to define what speed, what fast uh, means. And here is a complete uh, mix up of the descriptive and the prescriptive. For example, he says that a requirement should be unambiguous, testable, or measurable. Now, first, this is very partial. There are many qualities, uh, quality factors of requirements in the book. I, I analyze this carefully, and I, uh, I have 14 of them. Uh, so this is only three. Why these three and not others? But it's worse than that. It's that you know there, it, it, you can have a requirements, uh, you can have requirements that are not ambiguous, that are not unambiguous, that are ambiguous. They're not testable, they're not measurable, they're still requirements, okay? The, this is mixing the prescriptive with the descriptive. The, uh, humans are not perfect, right? So we, if we have a requirement which is ambiguous, which is not testable, which is not measurable, well, it's still a requirement. So we, we should uh, go at it, especially in a standard where we should be very precise and uh, uh, definitive we should be very careful about distinguishing the, de the definition from the advice. Of course, our requirements should be uh, unambiguous, but that's already in the second step. And the, the, there's something similar. Unfortunately, I don't know if you see, uh, Jan, does, uh, do people see the, the, the whole? Actually, I can, uh, I can see it for myself. This is a much more recent standard, actually. It's, I think it's the one that was mentioned in the um, comment on the uh, discussion board. Requirements elicitation. Use of systematic techniques such as prototyping and structured surveys to proactively identify and document customer and end user needs. Well, this is not very useful, honestly. First, it's, it's already a bit prescriptive by suggesting techniques. Why prototyping and structured surveys, not others like um, a stakeholder workshops, stakeholder interviews? This, is, this seems to be just like the, the pet peeve of some person on the committee who was pushing for prototyping as a requirement technique. And then in terms of quality, it's just not very good. It talks about customer and end user needs. Well, needs are not requirements. Actually, there is a definition of requirements in the same standard which which uses needs but goes beyond needs. It's actually pretty reasonable. Why not use re requirements rather than needs? And it says customer and end user needs. Well, the same standard has a definition of stakeholder, which is much more general than customer and end user. It includes those two categories. So why, why not use this definition? So we, we, we can do better. We can do better as a profession. To me, these are 
um, uh, signs of a not very mature discipline, and I think we're more mature than that. So let me uh, now, uh, now that I have, uh, you know, uh, immodestly um, uh, shown some limitations of uh, uh, standards uh, de devised by uh, very prestigious committees or very prestigious organizations, let me let me try for a replacement. So first, so how can we define requirements? First, the context. So the context is the one I gave already. Uh, the aim is to execute a project uh, in a certain environment to achieve certain organizational goals uh, by developing a system. So that's the context. Now, in the, it's important for people who may not be familiar with this uh, work, in particular by uh, Pamela Zave and Michael Jackson in the 90s, to understand why we distinguish between system and environment. And it's one of those things, once you've seen it, you, it's very clear, but they, they had to come up with this important distinction because they were fed up with people mixing you know, requirements, documents, things that you have as an IT person, as a developer, for example, an influence on and things that you do not have any influence on. So, for example, assume you're building a railroad crossing control system. You, you might have a requirement element which says the gate shall close at, in at most three seconds. So this is something that is imposed on you. So it's part of the system. Uh, Jackson and Zave also call this the machine. Okay, they also talk about machine versus domain, same thing as system versus uh, environment, uh, environment. So the gate shall close in three seconds. This is a system a requirement. It's something that you have to do as the builder of the system. Now you cannot do it un unless you have some assumptions about, for example, the speed of trains. If you if you don't know an upper bound for the speed of trains, you'll never be able to achieve this. So you also need things like trains shall be assumed to travel at no more than 300 kilometers an hour. That comes from the environment. It's not something that you have an uh, in, in influence on. So this is an example of this important distinction between system and environment. Now, continuing with the definition, the we, we have a notion of property. It's a predicate. This is somewhat redundant. A predicate is a Boolean on the project environment goal or system. So an example of a property would be all humans are mortal. It's, it's a predicate, something that is true or false. Now, we are only interested in relevant properties. A property is relevant if it's of interest to some stakeholder. Otherwise, projects, for example, have lots of properties that are completely of no interest, like uh, two developers are called uh, Jenny. Okay, this is a property of the project, uh, a Boolean property of the project, but uh, it is not relevant. So we are going to limit ourselves to relevant properties. And then we have a statement. So I said something not quite right a moment ago when I said that all humans are mortal is a property. Well, there's an underlying property, but what I gave you is a statement of that property in my approximation of English. So what, what we're talking about really is statements and I could have another statement of that uh, same property in French or in German or in Russian, or but, but I could also, um, the, this is, the, the slides are really messed up. With, I, I have to explain that I, I, I was going to share my screen and uh, the uh, screen sharing software never installed. So that, that's why we are resorting to, to this technique, but apparently somewhere along the way, uh, the slides were messed up. I apologize for, for that. I hope it's still understandable. So the, uh, we have a big circle, which is mortals, a smaller circle or ellipse, which is humans. So these are Venn diagrams. It's another way of expressing the same property, or I can express it in mathematics or in, in Eiffel. It should say uh, X dot is mortal. This is exactly with a dot. This is exactly the way you would write this in Eiffel. It's also mathematics. This is a formal version of the same property. So uh, with these concepts, we can define what a requirement is. A requirement is a statement of a relevant property of the project environment goals or system. And you know, you can compare this with the previous definitions. Uh, I'll let you be, be, be the judge. Now, in a paper where we introduce some, where we discuss some of these uh, concepts, my colleague and, uh, colleagues and I uh, introduced a taxonomy of requirements with a number of categories, some of which are listed here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Let me just give you a couple of examples. For example, towards the middle of the, of the list, we have a product. This is a project. 
um, requirement, it specifies that a certain task, so that's part of the project, is going to use or yield a certain uh, artifact. Uh, another example, the next one is a uh, constraint, which is a condition imposed by the environment. So we came up with a taxonomy of requirements in something like 12 categories altogether, including some which are a little bit surreal in some ways, like noise, well, our, the, if we were prescriptive, this would not exist because the requirements would be perfect, but uh, in practice, requirements are not perfect, so no, noise is a property that isn't a requirement but should not be. It's, it's just uh, babbling. Okay? It's uh, additional information that is distracting. Uh, the other way around, you have the silence, something that should be in the requirements but isn't. And then you have meta requirements, which are properties of the requirements but not properties of the um, project uh, environment and so on. So, for example, the section header is part of the requirements, but it's not a uh, it's not a uh, requirement in, in the previous set. Okay, so that's for the descriptive part. Some basic definitions in in uh, in the paper that I uh, just uh, re referred to, and also in the book. Of course, there's a much more detailed analysis of the requirement elements and also relations. We uh, tried a, a taxon to develop a taxonomy of relations between requirements. So now I'm going pr prescriptive, and here are a few principles, a subset of those which uh, will be in the, in the book, which a few ideas which uh, have uh, uh, seemed to me over the years to be really important. Requirements effort principle. Now, when you're talking a certain subject, of course, it's tempting to say that it's the most important thing in the entire world. Well, it's not, okay? Requirements are not important in, in themselves. Requirements are there to, uh, as a means to an end, and the end is to produce good systems. So the consequence of this uh, observation is that uh, we should not get involved into what uh, agile people call analysis paralysis, the uh, scheme by, whereby you spend so much time analyzing the problem that you never actually uh, get to building a, a satisfactory solution. So we should devote enough effort to requirements to guarantee quality, but not so much as to detract from other tasks. And in other words, we should know where to stop. Second a principle, requirements are software. Okay, requirements are not something completely different, the documents or uh, texts. Requirements are elements that uh, have most of the characteristics of code, for example. Code is executable, the requirements are not. But other than that, many of the properties of code and other software artifacts like tests or uh, designs uh, also apply to requirements. In particular, in software, we have soft, and uh, the ability of software to change is, uh, in my opinion, maybe possibly the central characteristics of software engineering, and it certainly applies to requirements as well as we're going to develop a bit, a bit more. Next, requirements management. Make requirements and all elements that help produce requirements or inform requirements available in a repository continuously maintained. We are in 2021, we don't write things with a pen and a paper anymore. We put things in a repository, be it SourceForge, GitHub, or whatever, and we should maintain that repository. This is, of course, a direct consequence of treating requirements as software uh, uh, subject to configuration management and everything else that we do to software. Now, requirements include not just requirements document. There's this nice classic paper by uh, Anthony Finkelstein, which talks about what he calls PRS, pre-requirement specification, all the sources of requirements. And today, this is not exactly his list, but it's a kind of extrapolation of his uh, 1994 list. You know, the much Information about requirements is to be found in emails, in PowerPoint presentations, in minutes of meetings, and so on. It's really important to keep these elements or at least references to them in the repository just mentioned. Then software is soft, requirements of software, so requirements uh, change. So they are a living asset of any project subject to evolution. This is, if you like, rejecting the view that requirements are a chore that you do at the beginning, you write them, and then you forget them, exaggerating a little bit, of course. But this is close to the attitude that you have in many uh, projects. Well, that's not 
it's not the case. Uh, in a successful project, requirements are a living asset which will continue to be adapted and maintained as well. So this leads directly to the next principle, which is, if you like, getting us out of this dilemma that we saw between the extreme uh, waterfall view of uh, doing everything at the beginning and, and then not touching the requirements and the extreme agile view of doing requirements just as we go. This, uh, they are both equally damaging, in particular, not doing upfront requirements at all out of religion, if you like, out of uh, you know, uh, belief in the purity of agile methods is very harmful. And I've seen more than one, well, more than a few projects which were doomed because no one took the time at the beginning of the project to sit down and just collect requirements. You know, where Agile, we code right away, we do use the stories. Well, this is this just doesn't work. Okay, so much for the principles. Now I'm coming back to, to the plan. I've shown the plan already. Um, let me mention what I mean by books. Okay. We, we, we do not necessarily have a linear document like the good old requirements document of all software engineering text textbook. Maybe we have four such documents, maybe not, not even that. The word book is sufficiently general. The elements can be anywhere. They, can be, they should be recorded in a repository. You may need linear versions, for example, for management or for regulatory agencies. So you should be, we should be able to rely on tools to produce linear versions. Uh, and um, the, the books themselves have a structure, and I'm not going to go through the entire structure, but le le let me point out a few interesting uh, sections. Now, I should say this structure uh, has been refined uh, over the, the, the past couple of years. I'm not claiming it's uh, final yet, but it's been discussed fairly heavily. I should also have mentioned that uh, my, my book is relatively concise and uh, doesn't have long examples, but my uh, colleagues and I are writing a companion book, which is an application of the approach to a full-fledged uh, industrial uh, case study having to do with autonomous vehicles. So there will be examples of this, and of course, we will follow the, the plan. So uh, starting with the goals book, the, the Goals book is there for everyone, for general stakeholders, in particular management, so customers, or people who are not necessarily uh, IT technical. So it should be written in a style that is that makes it understandable by many different people. It shouldn't use any computer science or information technology uh, jargon. To put the, the sections, I think, are fairly self-explanatory. G.4 is a kind of capsule, very short overview of, of the system book. The uh, G.5 is important because uh, you need to say where the scope of this system solves. You know, it's an accounting system. It doesn't do payroll. Um, G.6 is also very important. Uh, who are the stakeholders? It's important not to forget potentially important stakeholders who could affect the system or be affected by it. Also, sources of requirements. Continuing with the project book, the project book describes the characteristics of the a project. Uh, the, uh, again, the sections are more or less uh, self-explanatory. Impose technical choices, P.3 is important because very often in companies uh, you have this kind of decision which is justified by uh, political decisions rather than by strict uh, technical arguments. You know, here we only use Microsoft projects. There they only use open source pro uh, products. I'm sorry, I said project, I meant pro pro uh, products. So uh, the, these things exist, you like them or you don't like them, but they should be documented. P.7 is an example of the idea of a, a requirements uh, uh, repository, which is a living uh, artifact. It describes their initially the requirements process itself. How are we going to go about collecting requirements? But then as the requirements uh, pr uh, process proceeds and the rest of the project uh, proceeds, we are going to update P.7 to report about the results of the requirements process. The environment book has among its very important components a glossary. This was already in the 1998 study, the importance of having a uh, glossary for the terminology of the field. Every technical field has its own terminology, which is really important to document. In particular, not just the, the true technical terms, which are not so dangerous because programmers at some point will ask if they don't understand. The really dangerous, uh, the really dangerous elements of terminology are words from ordinary 
language, for example, ordinary English, which are hijacked in a very specific sense in a particular uh, problem domain. And this is really treacherous, for, for, uh, treacherous for, for, um, uh, for developers because they don't necessarily realize that a, uh, an English word is being used in, in a non-standard fashion. Then you have constraints which are imposed by the environment, assumptions, which are hypotheses that you decide to make about the environment, effects which are consequences on the environment, uh, constraints are also called preconditions, and effects are also called postconditions, and then you have invariants which are both free and post. That is to say, they, have, they can be assumed and they have to be maintained. Finally, the, the system book, um, uh, again, focusing on one uh, for perhaps less obvious section, S.5 is about prioritization. This is an, uh, an advice that, of course, you find in many software engineering textbooks. Uh, projects uh, encounter difficulties. That's of, you know, uh, stuff uh, happens. So if you have to sacrifice some functionality because you're late, because the budget is cut or whatever, you want to do this based on a predefined plan, not in a uh, panic. So this is the plan that we are uh, recommending. And of course, uh, I will make available, we will make available templates for applying the plan, uh, the plan in things like Microsoft Word and other uh, formalisms. And uh, we also hope to provide some tools to help support these ideas. Having this distinction between the four books makes it possible to be uh, fairly precise as to the structure of the requirements. So for example, uh, some references are possible and others not. The uh, project can reference the environment. The project can also obviously re reference the goal. The project can talk about the system because of course it's, the, it's going to describe the various uh, phases of producing the, the various pieces of the system. The goals can refer, uh, reference the environment, uh, so does the, uh, also, it's also the case with the system, and the system can talk about the goals. But there are also things which are not uh, per permitted, right? Like, for example, the environment should not talk about the project. The environment exists regardless of any project. The uh, system should not talk about the project. The system should be describable independently of how it's going to be to be built. Uh, in a similar vein, uh, we have verification obligations. It's, very, it's really important to be able to verify uh, requirements. This is the, there's a certain literature on the topic, but there's still much work that remains to be done. And maybe these ideas uh, can help a little bit understand what needs to be verified. So for example, the project should be verifiable against the goals. The system should also be verifiable against the goals. The system should, uh, for, for example, satisfy the constraints of the environment and the goals should be compatible with the environment. So if uh, this is still uh, very um, inchoate, but the, uh, if we are serious about verifying systems, we can go in this, uh, we can start from this. Okay, last part, uh, effect on the life cycle. Um, the, what kind of life cycle should we have and uh, w what is the role of requirements in, uh, in this life cycle? The, the waterfall review is one extreme, uh, the, the waterfall, and it, it, there's really a misunderstanding re regarding the waterfall you know, because the waterfall serves one obvious purpose, which is as a follow, right? If you have some good, some methodology that you think is good, you're going to take shots at the waterfall because it will make you look good. But in reality, no one uh, uses the uh, waterfall. It's a pedagogical device. Even the first uh, Royce 1970 article, which introduced the concept of waterfall, was already there to criticize it. So it, the waterfall is there for basically for software engineering courses in universities, where you, you describe a full spectrum of uh, possibilities at one extreme, which is the waterfall, you have something that is very strictly organized, too strictly organized to be organized and too synchronous, too monolithic to be applied in practice. And then at the other, at the other end, you would have a completely hacked, completely informal uh, uh, process, you know, code first, think later. But it's, it's, it's useful. It actually has, a, this model has a number of really good ideas along with its obvious de deficiencies, but that's what it is. It's a pedagogical de device. Um, the Agile model, it's not exactly phrased like this, and I'm going to simplify a little bit, but the, the 
the agile uh, approach doesn't have an official life cycle model, but in practice, it's something like this. And typically in Scrum, but also in uh, extreme programming, to some extent, you have a, a sequence of iterations known as a sprint, each of which produces a working system. So that's one of the key ideas to be able to produce a working system at every stage. And at every stage, you have a bit of requirements, typically in the form of user stories, and a bit, well, maybe some design and a bit of implementation, the three being very closely linked to, to each other. Uh, for, for many years, I've been uh, pushing, along with other people, a, a seamless uh, development model. This, this is not my, my invention. It, uh, it was mentioned already in the OMT uh, book in the uh, 80s, and uh, Brian Henderson Sellers uh, also uh, pushed for this uh, model uh, very, very strongly. The idea is, instead of emphasizing the differences, the discrepancies, the impedance mismatches between the various aspects of software development, let's try instead to emphasize the commonality and uh, see if we can have a single framework, a single set of concepts, and importantly, a single notation to cover everything all the way from requirements to design to implementation to uh, validation and verification to to testing and, and, and maintenance okay so and this is the re this is the way i use the uh, eiffel language is to serve as the common um, uh, thread throughout all of this so the the mini life cycle that we have for individual clusters in this approach, I'm going to define cluster in a second, it is a seamless life cycle in the sense that we work with clusters. Okay? I'm assuming we're object oriented and we don't really start anew at each step. We don't go, through, for example, uh, as in a model driven approach from a modeling notation to a programming language. We actually stay within the same notation. We add, start, we add and refine. Okay? So we, we might have at a requirements level very problem-oriented classes, and then as we go down in this um, progress, we have more and more concrete uh, classes like, uh, you know, counter or hash table at the level of implementation. Now, this is part of a more general model. Uh, yeah, I should also uh, say that one of the benefits of this uh, re uh, seamless approach is to support reversibility. That is to say, if you realize uh, that you didn't do things quite right, if you have a better idea, then you can go back much more easily than if you have impedance mismatches, for example, with a, a UML or a graphic abstract notation for uh, requirements and design and a programming language for implementation. The, a related idea, which I discussed in a paper of mine a few uh, years, years ago, is multi-requirements where we intertwine, interleave uh, various levels of discourse. It's a little bit in the style of uh, Knuth's uh, literate programming, but with a uh, different uh, goal. Uh, so here, uh, extracted from this article, is an example of a mix of natural language uh, in, in English, uh, in graphics, which is a kind of UML-like notation, formal, which in this case is, is Eiffel uh, text, all, uh, of course, referring to each other and being closely enmeshed with each other. Uh, if, it seems to work well in practice. Now, the uh, the, the notion of the, the seamless model leads to the, the cluster uh, model. Uh, again, the uh, uh, display of the slides a little bit messed up. It should say cluster one, cluster two, cluster n uh, at the top. Sorry for this. But the general idea is that we have a mix of synchrony, in, in other words, parallelism in the development of the various uh, clusters and uh, sequentiality within each cluster. What's a cluster? It's a group of classes. So it's a, it's a subsystem, small or slightly uh, larger. So you, you have the flexibility, for example, as the project leader, to start some clusters earlier, to delay some clusters, and to mix this uh, concurrent and sequential engineering, which is really important in uh, practice. And in the lifecycle model that I'm presenting uh, now, which will be my uh, almost my last point, uh, I'm trying to combine the best of all these approaches that I've described, including some that I've skipped, like the spiral model, which is really at the basis of the Agile model. That's why I skipped it. So we retained from the Agile model the idea of working in successive sprints. Each sprint has uh, two parts, a sprint definition and a sprint implementation. And of course, this is iterative. So, so far, uh, apart from the distinction between definition and implementation, it's very similar to a Scrum-like sprint 
um, uh, model. Now, in the sprint definition, in other words, uh, requirements, uh, p p perhaps a bit of design, but uh, let's focus on requirements. We, no, actually just requirements, sorry. Uh, it's not design, design goes in, in the second part. Uh, we have things that can be done in parallel and, uh, and things that can't. So for example, goals and environment, we can work this out in parallel, but we cannot uh, start a project before we have the goals, for example. We do, we can, of course, uh, plan the project in parallel or do the project uh, planning in parallel with the definition of the clusters. Okay, we're def going to, de to define the, uh, the clusters of the system and then we're going to validate this result. If we're not happy, we, will, uh, we might uh, iterate. Then the result of this definition phase is that we have selected a number of clusters to work on during this uh, sprint implementation phase. Some clusters that we had started in the previous sprints and that we are continuing because they're not finished, and some that we are starting anew now, that we're starting in, in this. So here we have the mini life cycle, uh, seamless life cycle, kind of a seamless waterfall that I described, each applied to a, a particular cluster in uh, parallel. And then we have a validation uh, phase, and of course we are going to iterate this. The, uh, the, the animation doesn't work for, for, very well, but you see the idea, which is that we are iterating this, and actually it's clearer in the next slide, which is going to show the, the, the full scheme. So the full scheme is a number of sprints, each of which is organized the way we just saw by a definition and an implementation phase. However, we need, a, we, we need flexibility. For example, as I said, we should have some kind of upfront requirements. So in the first sprint, we might have mostly requirements, okay? Uh, because this is upfront stuff, we need to define the, the problem. We might already have a bit of implementation. One of the things that Agile people have told uh, us is that it's, very, it's a very bad idea to not have a working system early because customers get nervous. Okay? So you need to be able to show something. So we might implement something small but convincing at the beginning. Still, typically, the first sprint is going to be mostly devoted to requirements. And then uh, the next sprint maybe have a little less requirements, still a, a strong requirements component, but we're already more ready to go into implementation. So we start with the critical clusters. And then uh, after that, the role of requirements shrinks in every subsequent sprint. It never, it never really disappears because uh, as, uh, as I mentioned several times, we, we, we will keep having new ideas. We will keep questioning the requirements. New elements are going to come in. So we need to update the requirements uh, at, e at each sprint. So it, it becomes uh, smaller and smaller. And then the, the, the last few sprints might be devoted mostly to validation and verification and final bug fixes. So the, the general model is the one that I uh, show, you know, with uh, uh, sprint uh, sprint after sprint, each of which uh, has a definition and an implementation phase. But in practice, we need the flexibility of devoting more or less time and effort to uh, to, uh, to to the two parts. Uh, what notations do we use? Well, I use Eiffel mostly for uh, anything that is uh, for formal, and of course, for goals, we have to use English. Let me make a final comment as to the role of object orientation, which also enables us to put everything in place, in particular with things like use cases and user stories. The, the notion of object-oriented requirements is quite clear. It's basically the same thing as object-oriented programming and design. We use the same concepts of modularizing around object types rather than functions, using the theory of abstract data types as the substrate, uh, information hiding, contracts, of course, which are, in my view, in my experience, are very important, and then inheritance and the associated techniques. Now, this seems to be completely incompatible with techniques of use cases and user stories, which are very precise which which um, uh, which focus on things to do rather than uh, things that we have you know they, they focus on actions rather than objects however if we take a uh, correct view, a broad enough view of object oriented modeling the notion of object is very broad we have you know the things that people think about the most naturally in an insurance claim 
uh, example, you know, vehicles involved in, 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 uh, in an accident, uh, the abstract concepts on the environment, like insurance policy. Then we have design abstractions like command in an undo, redo uh, command pattern. And then we have implementation classes. But we can also have scenarios. There's nothing that prevents us from representing a use case as an object. And here I'm referring to a nice PhD thesis by Alexander Naumchev, which introduced this notion of specification driver, a specification driver being an object that describes the behavior, the potential behavior of other objects. So as, a, as an example, you know, taking um, fr from uh, a book on use cases by um, uh, Alistair Coburn. This is a use case, a, a, a standard uh, use case with the various uh, steps in this scenario. And the, the point here is that you, you actually don't need to put use cases and object-oriented requirements in a position. You can very well have an object-oriented model that includes all the kinds of objects that I mentioned earlier, objects from the environment, objects from the system, objects from the project, and so on, but also objects that represent scenarios, like you know, this is the uh, kind of abstraction of what uh, was in the previous slide in Alistair Coburn's text, a, um, a use case process complete claim with, again, this I here is a dot, C, dot, all documents, in order, in, you know, preconditions, postconditions. I think there's a lot of, to, to be done here, and a lot to be gained from integrating uh, use cases, as in this example, and possibly user stories in, in the scheme. Let me, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, of course, I'm making my slides available at least a correct version of the, of the slides uh, with the, with the uh, formatting problems removed. So you, you will have uh, access to all the references that I'm mentioning, including, except for the book, uh, a URL for each of them. Let me just say a word to conclude about my uh, institution. Uh, one of my institutions, the Schaffhausen Institute of Technology, where I teach. It's a new technology university based in uh, Switzerland, next to this magnificent site of the uh, Rhine Falls, the, the kind of uh, European version of uh, Niagara uh, Falls, a little smaller, but equally impressive. Uh, we are focusing on three areas, computer science, uh, physics, and uh, digital business, with a strong focus on interdisciplinarity, which is, uh, uh, of course, uh, what these three uh, areas naturally lend themselves to, but is not enough uh, exploited elsewhere. Currently, we're still pretty small. We have two research chairs, in including mine, uh, both in software engineering, and we have a master program, I think I can say, uh, very successful. Uh, which is in, in computer science and software engineering with a with not just technical courses but also a strong focus on leadership courses and uh, if you um, and let me also mention that we have uh, an event ne next week so if you haven't had enough of me and want to hear me again on a completely different topic uh, we have a graduation ceremony but we also have a talk by me on something completely different the beauty of software you know and I, like many people in our field I've been impressed by the beauty of some of the ideas that we manipulate on a daily uh, basis or on a more rare uh, basis and beauty is very elusive um, it's in the eyes of the uh, beholder but still you know, totally immodest and uh, following on the footsteps of people like Kant and Hegel, I'm trying to, uh, in a very uh, provisional way, to, to define what uh, beauty is and uh, to describe how this concept of beauty is applied in software. So I will show a few beautiful algorithms and other examples. I don't have much time, but I'll take a few examples. So lessons from this presentation. Requirements are a key part of the software process. They have to be managed like software. They are software and should be managed like it. They are important, but they should not cause analysis paralysis. They are a means to an end, not an end in themselves. They cover the four aspects uh, that I've mentioned, and uh, the four are of equal importance. The document should reflect this structure, as in the plan that I've proposed. They should have a seamless relationship with other products of the software lifecycle, like uh, design, implementation, and uh, tests and they can serve to determine a modern, a flexible development model. And I think the next slide is for uh, Will to show. Okay, uh, I messed up with the...
Yeah, the, these notions put together determine a modern flexible development model. And the last point I covered, which is not mentioned in this summary list, is the ability to use object-oriented uh, programming, meaning the concept of abstract data type, to have a completely holistic approach to covering just about all the artifacts of requirements. Thank you, Bertrand. Thank you, Bertrand. Uh, <laughs> Let's move on to the 50 questions. <laughs> I must say, you will have a lot of topics to add to your book. So the first <laughs> okay. question is, thank you for the topic. I was wondering if this is not making requirements documentation process more complicated. Well, if, if so, I've really, uh, I've really failed. I mean, I, I mean, requirements actually can be very complicated in big projects, and um, my aim is to provide a, a clear structure. For example, having the, uh, the classification of requirements, the taxonomy of requirements that I uh, sketched, and which is uh, explained in detail in the publications, I think this helps. It actually helps make things more simpler, more simple, because you know for each thing that you may want to say about a system, uh, you can know what it applies to, you can uh, cl classify it. I also think the structure uh, in, uh, of the books uh, actually helps make things more simple. There was a, I mean, in one of those questions that was circulated before uh, the meeting, I saw a question which more or less read, uh, you know, for four books, uh, six or seven, uh, five to seven questions, uh, sections in each of them is uh, so, you know, 20 or so uh, elements. Isn't that making things uh, too complicated? Well, uh, I would say no, because these things happen or and exist uh, anyway. Actually, uh, in my original iterations of this plan, I had many more sections. And so uh, I really tried very hard. to uh, unify 